Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for our worship service today. And I praise the Lord for you in particular. That you're always there. You have a heart to worship the Lord. And the blessings of worship will be upon your life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day of worship. Sunday, the first day of the week. The day of resurrection. That's the day of renewal and the day of revival. And I pray, Lord, that your revival power will elevate everyone out of the deadness of the past and bring us to life in Christ fully in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you open our eyes of understanding, that we'll see and behold what you have preserved for us in your word in Jesus' name. Bless everyone, fathers, mothers, children, boys, girls, uh, newcomers, everybody. Bless us together in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today as we come to the scriptures, you've seen already from the Sunday scripture session that we are looking at some 14 psalm 53 and psalm 15 let me start from verse 1 of psalm 14 the fool has said in his heart there is no god they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none that doeth good and then from there i'm moving on now to psalm 15 in Psalm 15, we're looking at verse 1. It says in Psalm 15, verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? As you bring those two verses together, chapter 14, verse 1 talks about the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. And yet in Psalm 15, we're told, Yes, there is God. He even has a holy habitation. And that holy habitation, the holy hill, is at Cana, who shall dwell there. That's talking about heaven. Psalm 14 talks about the earth, what people think, what people say, how people live on the earth. And then there is the end of that life. And when that life comes to an end, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Well, if you're being in Psalm 14, you need to do something. We're told in Proverbs chapter 9, and we're looking at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 9, we're reading from verse 6. It tells us, forsake the foolish and live. If you're going to live forever with God in heaven, if you're going to live forever with Christ our Redeemer, if you're going to live together with the angels and the saints of God in heaven, forsake the life in Psalm 14, forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. Let's come to the New Testament in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Bring those two things together. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 6, we're told, Forsake the foolish. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, Follow after righteousness and then you will get to the experience and you'll get to the blessing of psalm 15 that's why we're looking at the subject today forsake the foolish and follow after righteousness to have fellowship with god forsake the foolish and follow after righteousness to live a happy life on earth healthy life in life and to live a satisfactory life on earth forsake the foolish and follow after righteousness and then uh, when the end comes on earth for you to get to heaven and for you to have the joy and to have the blessing and to have the privilege of living forever and forever in that holy hill holy habitation of god and in heaven you forsake the foolish and follow 
after righteousness. Today, we're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, recognizing the fools in their emptiness. If I'm going to forsake the foolish, I need to understand and I need to recognize the fools in their emptiness. Actually, we recognize the fools by the emptiness of their utterance. We recognize the fools by the emptiness of their lives. We recognize the fools by the emptiness of their profession. Recognize the fools in their emptiness. Number two, revealing the fool's future after the earth. After we have lived here on earth, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, there you understand that there is nobody that lives on this earth forever and ever and ever. Even Methuselah that lived a more than 900 years on earth, eventually one day he lived. Everybody will leave this earth and they will face the future. And if somebody has lived as a fool and has spoken as a fool all through his sojourn on earth, we need to reveal the fool's future after the earth. But then I come to you now, child of God, I come to you, the one that has a heart to be in heaven. That's point number three, running the race in all faithfulness without entanglements. Let's come to number one. We're coming to uh, Psalm 14 now. We're looking at recognizing the fools in their emptiness. Let's look at Psalm 14 verse 1. Psalm 14 verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, in this psalm, we're going to look at three things. Number one, living like a fool in evil. The fool that plunges himself, herself into evil and does not think of the consequence of that kind of life living like a fool in evil. Number two, laboring as fools in error. The people that labor, they labor, they may not be idle, they may be very active and very much occupied, but they labor as fools in error. And then if somebody lives like a fool and he labors like a fool, it's going to lament eventually, lamenting with other fools at the end. Look at number one. In number one, living like a fool in evil. It talks about that in Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Understand that? The fool has said in his own heart, he has said to himself, he has said privately, there is no God. And because he has said, there is no God, he lives without God. He lives without thinking of God. He lives without thinking of the law of God. He lives without thinking of the necessity of having relationship with her creator, with her redeemer. The fool has said in his heart, in his thoughts, in his mind, in his plans, that there is no God. A person who lives like that is living like a fool. How does somebody who lives like a fool, how does he live? Somebody who says there is no God, how does he live? As you look at all these verses that we have in Psalm 14, you will see how he lives. Number one, he lives recklessly. Recklessly. He's reckless about life. He doesn't know there's any future. He doesn't know there's any God. He doesn't know there is a lawgiver. He doesn't know there is a judge of our lives, a judge of our action. He lives dangerously. And look at a person the way he's driving and he's driving dangerously and he can kill himself and hurt himself. A person who thinks there's no God lives recklessly. He lives dangerously. He lives purposelessly. He doesn't have a purpose in life. He's going here and there. And because there's no purpose, he says, after all, there is no God. And there is no God to regulate his life and to regulate his action. He lives lawlessly. 
a person who thinks there's no God, he doesn't know the law of God. It's like if a person, my brother, my sister there, is living without the recognition of the law of gravity. He doesn't understand. If you throw something up, it will come down. He doesn't live by the law of gravity. And he doesn't understand if he jumps down from a high tower, he's going to break his bones, he's going to die. He lives recklessly. He lives dangerously. He lives purposelessly and he lives also lawlessly. He doesn't recognize this God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This is the person that lives gracelessly. He doesn't get grace from God. He doesn't receive grace from God. All he knows is that I'm here today. I eat, I sleep, I wake up, I eat, I sleep. He doesn't have the grace of God. He doesn't have the word of God to guide him. He doesn't even believe in the Bible. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And because of that, that's why he lives gracelessly and he lives godlessly. He doesn't factor God. He doesn't bring God into the equation of his life. Such a person also is uh, living without any recognition of the will of God, of the mind of God, and therefore he lives carelessly. That's why the Bible says here, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Those who say there's no God, they are corrupt. That's their lifestyle. They have done abominable works. That's their lifestyle. There is none that doeth good. That's their lifestyle. Look at verse 2 there. In verse 2, it tells us about them. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And then in verse 3, it tells us that they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. They are all together become filthy. When somebody thinks there's no God and he doesn't recognize the law of God, and he doesn't recognize the will of God, the word of God is going to live a defiled life, a filthy life, a sinful life. He lives senselessly. He doesn't have any sense at all. He doesn't think about what he does. If I go on in this wrong attitude and this pattern of life, where will I end even in this life? And because it doesn't bring even common sense into what it does. He lives, he feels the life. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. It says in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, Of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge. They work, but they work iniquity. They work, but they work abomination. They work, but they work evil. And it's like they have no knowledge. Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. Then in verse 5, it tells us about them. They are in great fear. For God is in the generation of the righteous. And let's look at how the New Testament puts all these together in Romans chapter 3. Looking at verse 10, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, he's talking about these people, and he said, as it is written, where is that written? That's Psalm 14, as it is written, where is that written? It is written in Psalm 53, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Then in verse 11, it says in verse 11, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. And because they are not seeking after God, look at verse 12. In verse 12, then it says they are all, none of them is escaping from this. They are all, there's no exception here. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They are all gone out of the way. They have gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There is none that thinks of doing good unto his neighbor. Everyone is self-centered. Everyone is selfish. 
Everyone is forgetful of a reckoning day, of the final day. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then in verse 13, it says in verse 13, their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues, they have used the seed. The poison of herbs is under their leaves. That is, their utterances, their conversation, and the, the things they say brings poison. It poisons people's lives, and it distorts people's lives. It destroys people's lives. And as we read all this, you think about yourself. If you are not born again, this is how your life will be. This is how your tongue will be, and this is how your lifestyle will be. In verse 14, it says in verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And sometimes you hear people abuse others, they insult others, they curse others, they slander others, they lie on others, and it is because they are part of the people that the Lord is describing for us in Psalm 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Now verse 15, verse 15 says, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Their feet are swift to shed blood. They don't think of the value of the life of other people and therefore they want to get rid of them, exterminate them. They want to kill them. In verse 16, it tells us, it says destruction and misery are in their ways. Then in verse 17, verse 17 says, and the way of peace they have not known because they do not know the Prince of Peace. Because they do not know Christ our peace. They do not know the way of repentance, the way of salvation, the way of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and inheriting eternal life. Because they do not know that, it tells us in verse 18, in verse 18 it says there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's why they walk recklessly, no fear of God, and they walk without purpose, no fear of God, and they walk lawlessly, there is no fear of God, they walk carelessly, there is no fear of God, they walk dangerously, because there's no fear of God before their eyes. Actually, in verse 19, it says in verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. All the world become guilty before God. Now these people, as we come back to Psalm 14, looking at verse 1, in Psalm 14 verse 1, we're looking at their labor now, laboring as fools in Aaron. It says the fool has said, in his heart there is no god i want you to imagine somebody waking up in the morning and the first thing he thinks about is there's no god i want you to imagine somebody uh, going on the road and he's driving and he's saying there's no god i want you to imagine somebody getting to the office or getting to the marketplace and all he's thinking is there is no god whatever i do it's all my decision. Whatever I do, it's all my plan. Whatever I do to my neighbor, whatever I do to my friend, whatever I do to the people I call my enemies, whatever I do to my employers, whatever I do to co-workers, doesn't matter because after all, there is no God. They labor as fools. There is an interesting and instructive passage of scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, reading from verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we're looking at verse 15. The labor of the foolish wearies every one of them. The labor of the foolish is foolish, but is laboring. You ask a person, you are learning how to read. Why are you learning how to read? Well, I just learned. And you think of a person, you are getting education. Why do you get this education? Well, I don't know. I just, I just get education. And you are working and you are earning money. Why do you earn money? I don't know. I just want to work. You get married. You have children. Why do you have these children? I don't know. He doesn't have a purpose. He's living and laboring purposelessly in life. The labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because he knoweth not 
is the characteristic of the fool. He knoweth not how to go to the city. He knoweth not how to go to the city. Do you know how to get to the city of God? Do you know how to get to the holy hill? Do you know how to live, how to dwell in the holy habitation? Are you just in religion, the labor in religion? Are you just in uh, outward work and the labor of profession? He does not know, is he full? He does not know how to go to the city. The Lord doesn't want us to just labor like that and labor like that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 16. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we're looking at verse 16. Here the Lord is saying, and this also is a so evil. It's a terrible evil. It's a painful evil that in all points, as he came, so shall he go. As he came to this world, so shall he go. And what profit has he that has labored for the wind? He has labored for the wind. Everything will evaporate. Everything will be blown away by the wind of life, by the wind of the world, by the wind of circumstances. And yet it's laboring. I want you to picture somebody in your mind. He goes to the farm. And he's harvesting grain. As he's harvesting the grain, he's putting the grain down. And then the wind is blowing everything away into the beach, into the ocean. And yet he keeps on, he keeps on laboring. And then he will harvest the grain. The wind will come again and blow everything away. And it does not stop. Where is the wind coming from? What's the direction of the wind? Why am I laboring like this? There are many people like that. They labor for the wind. And yet, there's no thought. What do I do? There is a God in heaven who could help me and stop that wind. They are laboring for the wind. They are not even thinking. Look at John chapter 6. We're reading from verse 27. Here is Christ telling us, labor not for the meat which perishes. Whatever we're laboring for today, in 50 years' time, what will be the value? Whatever we're laboring for today, in 100 years' time, what will be the profit? If that is the only thing we have, something that will be useless after 70 years, something that will be useless after 100 years, and even when they are giving the person a befitting burial, as the people say, if they were to bury that thing with him, it's of no value. He cannot enjoy it. He cannot take it to the other side of the grave. The Lord is telling us, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life. A salvation for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life. Our relationship with God, our righteousness, for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life. That holiness without which no man shall say the Lord that you consecrate for that, that you ask for that, that you pray for that, that you possess that, and that you allow the grace of God to deepen it and strengthen it in your life. You labor for that which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. The salvation that comes from Christ, the sanctification that comes from Christ, the grace that comes from Christ, the sufficiency that comes from Christ, it says that is what to labor for. That is what to go to the throne of grace for and get from the Lord. For him as God the Father sealed. Number one, let us not labor like a fool. Number two, let us not labor as a fool. If somebody lives as a fool and he labors as a fool, eventually he will lament like a fool at the end. He will lament like a fool at the end. I want you to look at uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 5, we're reading from verse 13. And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, 
to incline my ear to them that instructed me. Here is the lament, here is the sorrow, here is the grief, the person saying, I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers. You know, in the secular, when we went to school, and as our children are still at school now, and the teachers tell them, this is how to answer a question like this, and this is how to present your solution and your answer. And the teachers have said everything well, everything perfect. But now, if we, at that time, when we were still in school, or maybe our children who are still at school now, if they discard the words of the teacher, and they go to the exam hall, and everything the teacher has said, they deliberately neglect, overlook, the words of the teacher. I want to be a child of my mind. I want to be a person of my own mind. The teacher has his mind. The teacher has his own education. The teacher has his own admonition. I want to be a person, a boy, a girl of my own mind. Eventually, because he did not listen to the teachers. He goes for the exam. Look at that. My teachers in all the subjects. And then he makes a fool of himself or of herself because I want to be a man, a woman of my mind. Textbook, forget textbook. All the teacher's instruction, forget all that. I'm going to just answer the way I feel. My son, my daughter, we don't pass exams like that. If we do that, when the result comes, we will regret, we will lament. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. But the same thing, the preachers are teachers of the world. Go into all the world and teach them all that have commanded you. They're teaching us, the pastor is teaching us. The Sunday scripture teachers are teaching us. Our ministers in singing, they're teaching us. Our leaders who are instructing us in the way of righteousness, they're instructing us, they are teachers. We're all teachers. And then if we go through life, we only listen, but we don't obey. Seek for salvation, we don't obey. Repent, we don't obey. Make your way right in the presence of God, we don't obey. Endure unto the end, we don't obey at last. At the end, we will have to regret and we will lament. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me. Verse 23. In verse 23, it says, It shall die without instruction. The instruction to live. The Lord has given us an instruction how to die, to die peacefully in the grace of God and die in righteousness and die in hope and die in expectation of getting to the kingdom of God. The teachers of the word have given us, but if we don't obey those words of those teachers, then he shall die without instruction and in the greatness of his folly. That's foolishness. If we hear the word of God and we don't, uh, you know, prepare our lives to be with God eventually. In the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. I pray you will not go astray. I pray your life will not be the life of a fool. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. Jeremiah Chapter 17, verse 11, as the partridge sitteth on eggs and archeth them not, so is he that getteth riches and not by right, and shall leave them in the midst of his days. Look at this now. And at his end, at his end, at his end shall be a fool. At his end shall be a fool. We're coming to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at Psalm 53. This Psalm 53 is very similar. And that's why we put it uh, next to Psalm 
14. Look at Psalm 53 from verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The same thing. But you see what we're looking at here? We're looking at the future of the fool after this earth. Revealing the fool's future after the earth. Where will the fool spend eternity? You see, man is not like an animal that comes to this life and then when it dies, it dies. Because you see, there is no place in paradise, there's no place in heaven for the animals. But God created heaven, the holy place, is holy habitation for uh, human beings. That's why he sent Jesus Christ, so that Jesus Christ will take away our sin and will take away our guilt, our condemnation. And Christ will make us to repent and believe on him and have eternal life. And our names will be written in the book of life. The name of animals are not written in the book of life. They live, they eat, they sleep, they walk, beasts of body, and they die. And that is the end. But in the case of man, in the case of a woman, my son there, in your own case, my daughter there, in your own case, we are supposed to live forever. We either live forever with God or we live forever without God. There is a future, but you see the fool as such in his heart, there is no God. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the defilement of fools on earth. The defilement of fools on earth. Number two, the destruction of fools at ease. The people who just live at ease. There's fire burning. There was an explosion in that community. And people are shouting, explosion, explosion, fire. And the fellow just stays there at ease, and the fire is gulping the houses and destroying all the surrounding. And the fellow is at ease, and he says, there's no problem at all. I don't see anything. All the shouting they are making, all that is fake. He doesn't face reality, the destruction of fools at ease. And then eventually the damnation of fools in eternity. And let's look at that in uh, that Psalm 53 verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God corrupt at thee. And they have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good because of that state of mind. And because of that, you know, I don't care attitude. And because of, I don't believe anything. You know? I don't believe what I don't see. I don't believe. I don't see tomorrow. I don't believe. I don't see uh, spirit, Holy Spirit. I don't believe. I don't see God. I don't believe. Because of that, they defile themselves. In fact, Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, Mark Chapter 7, reading from verse 21. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21, the words of Jesus from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Look at verse 22 now. And notice this word there, the foolishness that ends the verse, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, and the deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. The totality of everything, the end of everything is the foolishness from the heart of man. It says in verse 23, in verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. What we're looking at now, the destruction of fools who are at ease. They take their ease and they commend themselves, they praise themselves. You know, I never worry about anything. I don't worry about sickness. I don't worry about life. I don't worry about what I have, what I don't have. You know, I don't rush at anything. 
They say they are going to church. Well, I can go to church, but I'm at ease. I don't hurry. And they say they want salvation, salvation, salvation. Yes, I want salvation too, but I'm not in a hurry. And they say holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. I want holiness, but you know, I take life easy. I'm not going to have hypertension. I'm not going to have a high blood pressure because of anything at all. Whatever I cannot get being at ease, I just let it go. The people who are at ease and they do not hurry up about anything and get what they ought to get. The destruction of fools at ease. We're looking at Amos chapter 6 and verse 1. Amos chapter 6, we're reading from verse 1. It says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Understand? You may want to underline that word Zion. That Zion represents the city of God, the people of God. There are people that are in the church, in the Israel of God, among the people of God. They don't take anything serious. They are in Zion, but they live at ease. If somebody uh, mistakenly falls into sin, he still lives at ease. If somebody just uh, surprisingly, shockingly goes into backsliding, he still at ease. If there is something to correct as we're near the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, is at ease. And the word of God says, Watch them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Let me show you a practical example in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're looking at it from verse 19. In Luke chapter 12, here is the story Jesus told about a man who was a prospered man, about a man who was a fruitful man, about a man whose field, whose farm actually yielded very much. And then Jesus said, this is what the man said, and I will say to my soul, soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. There are people like that. All they look for and all they think about to feed the body. And they become fat and forgetful. All they think about is what they drink and they become fat and forgetful. All they think about is merriment and throwing feasts and throwing parties. And that's what they live for every Saturday, every weekend. They are either in one naming ceremony or in another marriage ceremony or they are in another funeral ceremony. Anywhere at the weekend, they must be at a place. They are party men and they are party women. And all they think about is, they say, you know, I don't think about life so seriously. I drink away my sorrow. I eat away my sorrow. I feast away my sorrow. Take thine ease, eat and drink and be merry. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, if God calls somebody a fool, that's a real fool, if Christ tells the story and he calls that man, that woman, a fool, that's a real fool. If the Bible describes a person as a fool, that's a real fool. He hears about salvation, doesn't care. He hears about holiness, doesn't care. All he cares for is what I will eat, what I will drink, the house I will leave. All he thinks about is something physical, is something natural. God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? My brother, my sister, fathers and mothers, daddies and mommies, 
leaders in the church and members of the church, boys and girls, teenagers and youths, what are we providing for eternity? How are we living for eternity? Everything we look for, every drive we have, every passion we have, and every effort we make is it only for the things of this life? Out of the 24 hours of the day, can we give one hour, can we give two hours to prepare for eternity? Out of the seven days in the week, can we give one day after going to market, after going to the office, after laboring and laboring for the things of this life, all those six days, can we give one day unto the Lord and prepare for where we're going to spend eternity? Or is it that even in church, we cannot concentrate on the word of God? We're either sending a text or we're sending a message. We're making an appointment. We're scheduling an appointment. It's all business, 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 money making all the time. The age will come. And we don't know when the end will come. And when that end comes, where will you spend eternity? Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? In verse 21, in verse 21 it says, So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. We've seen the defilement of fools on earth. We've seen the destruction of fools at ease. Now, the damnation of fools in eternity. The damnation of fools in eternity. In Proverbs chapter 7, reading from verse 22. In Proverbs chapter 7, reading from verse 22. He goes after her straightway. As an ox goeth to the slaughter, and as a fool to the correction of the stalks. This is talking about a man who is ruled by the flesh. This is talking about a man who is driven by the passion and the feeling of the flesh. This is talking about a man whose emotion and feeling and desire for pleasure blindfolds him. He will not hear the sound of the horn of a car coming behind. He will not see the sight of the fire that is burning in front of him. He will not see the danger, the destruction of hell in the future. As he fool, he rushes on. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, it says, Till a dart strike through his liver. As a bird he stayed to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Look at verse 26 there. In verse 26, for she has cast down many wounded. That is the lady, the woman that this foolish man is rushing after and is not thinking about the future. And the man is driven by emotion, is driven by the flesh. The man is not thinking about the age of the action he's going to have with this devilish, defiling, and sinful woman. For she has cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Verse 27, it says in verse 27, a house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. The future is very important, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter. The future is very important. Whatever we do now, we should be asking ourselves, don't rush, don't rush, don't rush. Don't rush into that action. Don't rush into that gang. Don't rush into that unequal yoke. Don't rush into that relationship. Where will this yoke, relationship, action, where will it end eventually? Think about the future. We're coming to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at Psalm 15. 
In Psalm 15, we're looking at verse 1. We're looking at running the race in all faithfulness without entanglement. Running the race, running the race in all faithfulness without entanglement. We're looking at Psalm 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? You have heard about Moses, and you have heard about Elijah. You have heard about Enoch. You have heard about Daniel. You have heard about Stephen. All those have gone beyond, and they abide in the eternal tabernacle of God, and they are dwelling in the holy hill of the Lord. How did they make it? And who else will make it? That's why this is telling us now, asking a question. How do I get there? How do I live there in the holy habitation of God? Three things we're looking at. Number one, abandon the righteousness of fools. Abandon the righteousness of fools. You know, when we mention righteousness, righteousness all the time, many people may not understand the kind of righteousness that takes us to heaven. Let me show you from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 20. Jesus said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. What kind of righteousness are you carrying? Let me ask it in a practical way. What kind of certificate are you carrying? Well, that certificate of righteousness, so to say, Will it be recognized in heaven? Does it have the stamp of the authority of heaven? Does it have the watermark of the word and the blood of the Lamb? Does it have the registration number of our Redeemer? You see, there are people that just seek righteousness, righteousness, and they do not have anything beyond the fake outward external righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. I want you to look at Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, we're looking at verse 9. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain, which trusted him in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And what was their righteousness? Look at this in verse 10. In verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. In verse 11, here is the righteousness of the Pharisee. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Look at his righteousness in verse 12. It says in verse 12, I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. In verse 13, it says, And the publican, standing afar off, will not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his chest, his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I repent. I'm not qualified for salvation. It's only of your grace. And I come for that grace. And I come for that salvation. And I come for your own kind of righteousness that you'll give me as a gift 
But you see the Pharisee, the Pharisee thought, I can make it by myself. I have righteousness. And as he reads Psalm 15, he that walketh righteously, he that walketh righteousness, and he that speaketh the truth in his heart, he congratulates himself. He said, that's me, that's me. I have righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 31. Romans chapter 9, reading from verse 31, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, wherefore, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They stumbled. They didn't have the righteousness of faith. They only had the righteousness of fools. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Philippians chapter 3, verse 6. Here is Saul. Before the Lord met him, and look at what he said concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And yet the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You claim to be righteous. Why persecutest thou me? You claim to be blameless. Why persecutest thou me? You claim to be religious, more religious than your colleagues. And yet you are persecuting me. He wasn't ready for heaven at that time. He had the righteousness, the outward righteousness, and the righteousness of the unrepentant sinner who will not make heaven. The Lord is calling us that if we're going to get to heaven, number one, we abandon the righteousness of full self-righteousness. Number two, we accept the righteousness of faith. We accept the righteousness of faith. That's how we can get to heaven. Look at Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 8. But what says it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, in verse 9, that if thou, that what thou means you, my brother, you, my sister, you, my daughter, my son there, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In verse 10, in verse 10 it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's the kind of righteousness that can take us to heaven. Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is a special name God calls this kind of righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, we're reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, this one is manufactured by God. This one is given as a gift by God. And you accept it, and you receive it, and you embrace it, and you believe in it, and it is through that the righteousness of Christ transferred into your life. That's how you become righteous. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It says in verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In verse 24, it says, Being justified freely. It's not something we pay for. We're justified freely by His grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 25 now and look at the righteousness the Lord is talking about whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness by the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare his righteousness. That's the righteousness coming from God directly. And he can give that to you. He can give that to everyone. You believe that Jesus died for you. He rose up for your justification. You say, he did all that for me. He took away my sin and he gave me his righteousness. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he gives us that righteousness. That's the righteousness in which we abide. That's the righteousness we are allowed to abound in our lives. Number three now, abide, abound. In righteousness as fruit. Abide, abound in righteousness as fruit. The fruit of our connection with Christ. The fruit of our relationship with Christ. Let me use a human language. The man gets related with the woman. They get married together, united together. They are now in this intimate relationship and therefore they are able to bear fruit. Come back. You are the bride and he is the bridegroom. And you come together, you believe in Christ and the fruit you bear because of your reconciliation with God, because of your redemption in Christ, the fruit you bear is righteousness. The righteousness as fruit. In Romans chapter 6, we're reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 6, verse 18. Being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. He makes us free. He makes us free. And because of that, we become the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. In verse 22, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The Spirit of God bears witness with your heart. That work has been done. Your redemption has been provided. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. And because of that salvation, you now have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Then in verse 23, it says, meekness, temperance against such, there is no law. Now you have the fruit, and that fruit is righteousness. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 9. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 9, it says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and faith. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That is what comes to your life. That is what comes to our lives as we give our lives to the Lord. And Christ who lives inside us, he lives in our hearts. 
by his presence in our lives, in our hearts, we now bear the fruit of righteousness. Let's come to Psalm 15, looking at it from verse 1. These are the people, the people that do not, they are not rejoicing in the righteousness of their own hand, in the righteousness of fools, but they have the righteousness of faith and the righteousness that comes as fruit. Now they can answer the question, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? By the grace of God, by the presence of Christ in your heart, and by the outworking of that grace of God in your life, you can now answer and say, by grace, I will be a candidate. I am a candidate already for that tabernacle. Who shall dwell in the holy hill? That word who you are now having assurance and the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart because of his righteousness that is worked out in your life, you will be in Jesus' name. Look at verse 2. We are now allowed the Spirit of God and the grace of God to be working in us. We are not rising and falling. We are walking uprightly, consistently. We are walking in righteousness and we speak the truth in our heart. We are now a man of the truth, a woman of the truth, and we are committed to the truth because Christ is actually the truth personified, and we live to please him, and we live to rejoice in him. And because he's the truth personified, we speak the truth in our heart. Look at verse 3. Here is uh, the person that says, I'm now a child of God. He backbiteth not with his tongue. He says, you know, I cannot backbite. I cannot talk about the other man, about the other woman. If it were not for the grace of God, I'll be like him. Has he done a bad thing? Has he done an evil thing? Only grace makes me different. Only grace makes you different. If I had not had the grace of God, if you had not had the grace of God, you'll be as rotten, you'll be as evil, and you'll be as sinful. Because of that, you say, God, I thank you. I praise your name. I would have been like that. Because of that, he backbited not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. My neighbor is innocent. Your wife is innocent. Your husband is innocent. Whatever is happening to you, whatever is happening to anyone, there is a devil in the world. And don't let us put, uh, you know, punishment and don't let us uh, retaliate on our wives, on our husband, on our neighbor for what the devil is doing. We're not going to do evil to any neighbor. No, take it up a reproach against his neighbor. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, In whose eyes a vile person is contempt, a person that remains vile and remains in defilement. We don't want him to splash that evil sin and that rubbish and that defilement on us. You are wearing the white garment of righteousness. And you know that if you get near where there is dirt and where there is evil, it may splash on you. Therefore, you keep your distance. In whose eyes, a vile person is contempt, but he honors them that fear the Lord. In that brother, he fears the Lord. There is a gift in him. I can benefit. There is grace in her. I can benefit. And therefore, I honor her. I honor him. I get near. He has something. That my brother has something. That my sister has something that can be a benefit to my life. And I don't look at her stature. I don't look at his stature. I honor them that fear the Lord. He that swore to his own hurt and changes not. That means he that makes consecration. I will follow the Lord. No turning back. No turning back. I will serve the Lord. No turning back. No turning back. The wind may blow. The best decision is the decision I've taken. I will follow the Lord. There may be persecution to get you away from that way of the Lord. The decision you have taken to follow the Lord and to commit your life to the Lord forever and ever until you get to heaven, that's the best decision you can ever take. And therefore, you will not allow persecution 
affliction or suffering or misunderstanding to get you away from that way of the righteousness of faith is where it is own heart and changes not in verse 5 it says he that putteth not out his money to use him he hates unlawful gain he knows money is not everything on earth money is not the all in all money is not almighty on earth he putteth not out his money to usury he has something more than money he doesn't have the love of money he has the love of god he has the love of christ he has the love of his neighbor he has the love of the brethren he has the love for heaven and he relegates the love of money to the background and therefore his life is not built on money 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 gain gain profit he putteth not out his money to usury no take it reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things by grace, he that doeth these things by the help of Christ, he that doeth these things by the indwelling spirit, he that doeth this thing by the enablement of the grace and the strength and the spirit of God in his life, in her life, he that doeth this things relying on God, not relying on our own strength, but relying on God, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. My brother, this is talking about you. You are a candidate for heaven. My sister, this is talking about you. You are a candidate for heaven. My boy, my girl, my son, daughter there, this is talking about you. You are a candidate for heaven. And the devil will not move you out of the way of righteousness in Jesus' name. If you're weak, he'll make you strong. If you don't have the strength and the backbone, the Lord will grant you the strength and the fortitude and the steadfastness. And by the grace of God, living one day at a time, he that doeth this thing, he that doeth this thing, he that doeth this thing, you are the brother, you are the sister, you are the man, you are the woman, he that doeth this thing shall never, never, never be moved. The Lord is on your side. He'll give you all the grace you need and all the strength you need. You will be the man, you'll be the woman you ought to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord himself will help us, will come out of the camp of the fool and will come to the congregation of the faithful, forsake the foolish. That just means if you have not repented, repent. If you have not repented from foolish thoughts and foolish mind and foolish attitude, repent and believe on the Lord Jesus, our Redeemer. Believe on the Lord Jesus. He is our righteousness. Say, Lord, I'm not coming uh, with uh, the righteousness of Pharisees and the righteousness of Sadducees. I come in the righteousness of the Lord and I come wanting to have your own righteousness. I transfer my shortcoming unto Christ. I transfer my pitfalls unto Christ. I transfer my weakness unto Christ. I transfer my foolishness unto Christ. And I take his wisdom. And I take his righteousness. And I take his goodness. And I take the new life that he's bringing. The Lord will do it for you. And now you follow after righteousness. The righteousness of faith. The righteousness by grace. The righteousness of God. The righteousness of Christ coming from Calvary. It's yours. It's available for everyone. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is yours. Righteousness is yours. And God will help you. You will make it on that final day in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for expatiating. Thank you for expounding the word of God unto us. Thank you, Lord, because you love us so much. You are getting us away from the congregation of fools. You are getting us away from the camp of fools. And you bring us to the congregation of the righteous, the congregation of the saved. And you are bringing us to righteousness by faith. Lord, 
we receive your righteousness. Lord, we embrace your righteousness. Lord, we believe in Christ, the righteous one. We pray, Lord, by your grace, by your strength, by your enablement, you help everyone, those who are just coming in to this righteousness of God. Give them assurance in their hearts, O oh Lord, their sins are forgiven, their sins are taken away, they are now children of God. And those who have been in the Lord all this while, strengthen everyone more, that we will remain in the righteousness of faith in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, in a practical way. Help us, Lord, in a definite way to walk in that righteousness of faith which will please you every time. Help us not to backbite, not to slander anyone, not to look down on anyone, and not to condemn anyone, but to see how many we can help to come into the kingdom. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Lord, strengthen us that this day we live in the grace of God, by the grace of God, and for the goodness of all our neighbors every time in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to be a good witness, talking to other people, bringing them into your kingdom. And when the trumpet shall sound, and then that gate will be opened to enter into the holy habitation and to dwell forever and ever in that holy hill, Qualify every one of us, none of us will be missing on that final day in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we're praying. And the people of God said, Amen. God bless you and God help you to bring others to this kind of righteousness, the righteousness of faith in Jesus' name.